If you could get all the people in an organization rowing in the same direction, you could dominate any industry in any market against any competition at any time. Those are bold words spoken by the founder of a company that grew to over a billion dollars in annual revenue. Like anything worth achieving in life, this is easier said than done. Especially because teams are made up of human beings, the most complicated and dysfunctional organisms on the planet. Although all teams are different, they tend to encounter the same issues over and over again. These are what Patrick Lencioni, the author of the book, calls the five dysfunctions of a team. These are the root causes of all the problems you face as a leader in getting the team to row in the same direction. The good news is that they can be cured if you're willing to put in the hard work that's required. We'll cover each of these dysfunctions in turn, including what you can do about them so that you can achieve your greatest goals. Dysfunction number one, absence of trust. This first dysfunction is all about the absence of trust among your team members. As Lencioni points out, trust is one of those words that gets used so often that it has lost some of its meaning. He says that he intends it to mean the confidence among team members that their peers' intentions are good and that there is no reason to be protective or careful around the group. So the root cause of this first dysfunction is most people's unwillingness to be vulnerable with the group. The natural tendency of most people is to hide their mistakes and weaknesses from their peers and bosses. Teams with an absence of trust, A, hide weaknesses from one another, B, don't ask for help or provide constructive feedback, C, don't offer help outside their own areas of responsibility, D, jump to conclusions about the intentions and skills of others quickly, E, don't recognize and tap into each other's skills and experiences, 4. Waste time and energy trying to look good, G. Hold grudges, and H. Dread meetings and find reasons to avoid spending time together. Teams that exhibit trust, A. Admit weaknesses and mistakes, B. Ask for help, C. Accept questions and input about the roles, D. Give each other the benefit of the doubt, E offer feedback and assistance to others, F, tap into each other's skills and experiences, G, focus time and energy on important issues, not politics, H, offer and accept apologies without hesitation, and I, look forward to meetings and other opportunities to work as a group. Overcoming a lack of trust. There are a few things you can do to get over a lack of trust on your team. One of the most powerful exercises you can do is a personal history for each person on your team where each team member shares information about themselves. When people find areas to connect with their team members on, like connections in common or shared interests, they are more likely to trust one another. You should also consider having your team take one of the many personality and behavioral preference profile surveys. Understanding exactly how people are different on a team can help create empathy for each other and help them work more effectively with one another. Finally, as a leader, your most important action is to demonstrate vulnerability yourself. How this relates to dysfunction number two. By building trust with one another, constructive conflict becomes possible. They know that they can argue and debate with one another without fear of being branded destructive or critical. Dysfunction number two. Fear of conflict. Most people dislike conflict and avoid it at all costs. Unfortunately, it's also one of the biggest drivers of dysfunction on teams. Before we hop into the idea of promoting conflict, it's important that we make the distinction between ideological conflict, which is the good kind, and destructive fighting in internal politics, which is the bad kind. What we're looking for here is more of the good kind and less of the bad kind. Teams that fear conflict, A, have boring meetings, B, create environments where internal politics and personal attacks occur, C, ignore controversial topics that are critical to team success, D, don't tap into all the opinions and perspectives of team members, and E, waste time and energy posturing to one another. Teams that engage in conflict, 
A, have great meetings. B, pull out the ideas of all team members. C, solve real problems quickly. D, minimize politics. And E, address critical topics on a regular basis. Overcoming a fear of conflict. The first and easiest step is to acknowledge publicly that conflict is productive. The second step is to mine for any unresolved disagreements among team members and get them resolved. Consider assigning somebody to this role. Coach your team members that they have permission to nurture healthy debate amongst one another. If you find them shying away from a tough conversation, coach them that what they're doing is important and necessary to the team's success. Finally, on the flip side, as a leader, you should practice restraint when it comes to resolving conflict. Our natural tendency is to eliminate conflict because it's uncomfortable. Resist the urge to step in when constructive conflict is happening. How this relates to dysfunction number three. When team members feel free to engage in productive conflict, they can commit and buy into a decision that's being made, even though they disagree with it because they feel like they've been heard. Dysfunction number three, lack of commitment. On a team, commitment is a function of two things, clarity and buy-in. If there's clarity on decisions and buy-in on what those decisions require for the team, great things happen. A team that fails to commit, A, creates ambiguity around direction and priorities, B, overanalyze and underact, C, creates a lack of confidence and fear of failure, D, revisits old discussions and decisions again and again, and E, encourages second-guessing among team members. A team that commits, A, creates clarity around direction and priorities, B, aligns the entire team around common objectives, C, develops an ability to learn from mistakes, D, takes advantage of opportunities before competitors do, E, moves forward without hesitation, and F, changes direction without hesitation. Overcoming a lack of commitment. One of the most valuable things you can do is end each meeting with a thorough review of key decisions made during the meeting and agree on what needs to be communicated to other team members about those decisions. This should take you at least 10 minutes to do correctly and is critical to your success in getting things done. Another discipline that will help you here is creating deadlines around decisions. If there are any unresolved decisions that need to be made, set a deadline around when you'll have a decision and stick with it. You can also bring contingency plans into your discussions in order to make sure everybody understands the worst case scenario if you've made the wrong decision. Sometimes teams won't commit because they haven't considered the consequences of things going wrong. If your team is truly commitment phobic, start off by having them make decisions in low risk situations. Finally, as a leader, you need to be comfortable in making decisions that ultimately turn out to be wrong. How this relates to dysfunction number four. When decisions and commitments are made publicly, team members are much more likely to be able to hold one another accountable. Dysfunction number four, avoidance of accountability. Lencioni suggests that the most effective and efficient means of maintaining high standards on a team is through peer pressure. But most people avoid accountability like the plague. They don't like others holding them accountable for things they said they would do, and they feel just as uncomfortable in holding others accountable for things that don't get done. A team that avoids accountability A. Creates resentment among team members who have high standards. B. Encourages mediocrity. C. Misses deadlines and key deliverables. And D. Relies on the leader as the sole source of accountability. A team that holds each other accountable. A. Ensures that poor performers feel pressure to improve. B. Identifies potential problems quickly. C. Establishes respect among team members who were held to the same high standards. And D. Avoids excessive bureaucracy around performance management and corrective action. Overcoming a lack of accountability. The first and obvious thing you can do is publicly clarify what the team needs to achieve and exactly what each team member is expected to contribute in order for that to happen. Then, 
simple and regular progress reviews will ensure that people continue to take action toward the goals you've set as a team. You should also consider shifting rewards away from individual performance to team achievement so that people feel the need to not only ensure that their performance is up to par, but their team members are also living up to their end of the bargain. As a leader, your role will be to function as the ultimate arbiter of discipline if and when the team fails. If you've set up the culture correctly, these instances should be few and far between. How this relates to dysfunction number five. When team members are not being held accountable for their contributions, they are more likely to pay attention to their own needs and wants, opposed to the results the team is supposed to achieve together. Dysfunction number five, inattention to results. Lencioni calls this the ultimate dysfunction of a team, the tendency of team members to care about something other than the collective goals of the team. There are a number of reasons why people might be focused on something other than results. For some people, just being a part of a team is enough to keep them satisfied. For others, focusing on their own career and status is more important than the results the team generates. Whatever the reason, having a team that has this illness ensures that everything else will fall apart. A team that is not focused on results, A, fails to grow, B, rarely defeats competitors, C, loses high-performing employees, D, encourages team members to focus on their own careers and individual goals, and E, is easily distracted. A team that focuses on results, A, retains achievement-oriented employees, B, minimizes individualistic behavior, C, enjoys success and suffers failure acutely, D, benefits from individuals who subjugate their own goals or interests for the good of the team, and E, avoids distractions. Overcoming inattention to results. There are a number of things you can do to overcome this dysfunction, but by far the most important is to publicly declare results. Teams that are willing to commit publicly to results will often do whatever it takes to get them done. A public scoreboard that is visible to everybody in your team will help drive this home. Then, you should consider tying compensation and rewards to the achievement of those public goals. As a leader, your role is to model attention to results. If the people on your team get the feeling that you are focusing on anything other than results, they'll feel like they can do the same. Hi, I'm Rhonda. And this is an exclusive audiobook video recorded for the Audiobook Master Channel. Enjoy your audiobook and have fun learning. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification button so you'll get updated on our next upload. If you liked the video, give us a thumbs up and say your thoughts about the book we just covered. Do you want to listen to a summary or review of a book that we haven't covered in the past? Say it in the comments below or send us a message. Don't forget to check our other uploads. Enjoy listening!